Okay, well, welcome everybody, and welcome folks at home. Um, so we're going to read a little bit from the book of Ruth, chapter 1, and uh, just take a few points out of that. Chapter 1, in Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Mahlon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Mahlon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And she kissed them and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who would become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than it is for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. I'm going to read from the AV because I think it's uh, more beautiful that just the way it's laid out in verse 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. And thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord be do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Just a couple of thoughts I have, just about this uh, little reading in Ruth. And uh, we'll see how we'll get through. Starts off in the days when the judges ruled. And they, of course, were dark days in, in Israel. Um, the period was characterised by that phrase, and it appears a, whole, a number of times in Judges, Judges 17, 18, 19, 21, um, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And in that sense, I think the book of Ruth, even for that alone, is a book we can identify with, um, because we live in days of, I think would agree, moral ambiguity at best, confusion in general, and degenerate depravity increasingly accepted as the normal valid life choice. C.S. Lewis uh, said this, it's a, it's a wee quote I love to use from time to time. He said, once people stop believing in God, the problem is not that they will believe in nothing, rather the problem is they will believe anything. And I think it sort of characterizes the time we live in. And for these days that Ruth lived in, they were similar days. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And um, the next thing it noticed was, of course, there was a famine in the land, and so off they went. Well, a famine, I looked it up actually in the encyclopedia, and according to the United Nations World Food Program, famine is declared when malnutrition is widespread and when people have started dying of starvation through lack of access to nutritional food. But um, we, we live in a, a national culture, I think, where that could actually describe our culture spiritually. Rather, physically, we're, we're well off. We have plenty to eat, and we're really blessed that way. Uh, but our temporal desires are, are, are fanned and ingratiated by the media and everything that surrounds us, clamoring for attention. And strained out of that, rejected almost, is the spiritual hunger 
And if you read that again, when malnutrition is widespread and when people have started dying of starvation, and there's that sense that we sort of live in that age where people are in famine spiritually, temporarily, all the food we can eat, but spiritually in a famine. And the, the famine of our souls, if you call it that, is so extreme that the tragedy is that the real fulfilment for that kind of hunger is being um, falsely promised by the huge choices that we have in the media around us and in our lifestyles and, and all kinds of material and temporal things. And, and all those things are given some kind of equivalence. And so what you find is, and some people do this with a serious intent, some claim that their religion is a Jedi Knight. Some say that they follow the great spaghetti monster. I'm serious. And uh, make up their own religions. And that's given the same mo equivalence along with historical Bible-based Christianity. And people pick and choose what they want to follow. Some people will say, tell you they're very spiritual. And just what that means, I'm not sure. But it don't, certainly doesn't mean they're biblical or Christian or a follower of Jesus. And so we live in a time of, it was one, as the French put it as laissez-faire, you know, um, let go, let, you know, if it's all right for you, it's all right for me, just do your own thing, let be, let be. And the trouble is, if anything goes, then one of the first principles that, that are true goes, which is truth itself. Because if anything goes, then nothing's true. Anyway, these tangled webs of confused thinking, I believe, are actually satanic. And they wrap around the minds of those who are confused in our world today. And we see it in our television, our politicians, and conversations maybe you have with people. People are utterly confused. And they just see Christianity as, they don't even know what it is, hardly know. They say, oh, I've heard all that. And whenever you sit down and ask them, they really don't know what the gospel is. Um, Matthew, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus spoke about the prophecy that was in Isaiah, and he said this, that they will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their hearts, ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and I would heal them. And I think there is that sense that people have sort of closed their eyes and that's been tried, that didn't work. And, and now we're into all the new, I mean, the new age came and went uh, and we're into all kinds of things now, well, all kinds of confusion that we'll have time to talk about. Anyway, let's look at Elimelech for a minute because what did Elimelech do? Well, he took his family out of the promised land and back to the desert from whence the Israelites had come in the first place. Now, there, there's a sense when you look at Elimelech, of course, the intentions were good. There was no food left in the land. So he's looking at his family, his two boys, his wife, and he goes to where he hears there is food and he heads down to Moab. Um, which, you know, in, in, in one sense, well, yes, well done, Elimelech. You, you've, you've looked out for your family. But in another sense, um, um, he's going back from whence they, in a spiritual sense, he's going back from where they came from. And... Sometimes we as Christians, and I know myself too, whenever things are difficult, maybe sometimes we fail to hear the Lord as we once did, and our hearts have become dry. Our love is weak, and our hope is a faint thread of the garment that once covered us. And like Abraham, who was given the promise that he would be a father of many nations, we know we've been given promises, but we, to be honest, sometimes we find them hard to really believe, really to take in, really to live in the good of them. And so what do we do? Well, um, Elimelech, he headed backwards. Um, he just headed backwards, back the way they come. It was a backward step for Elimelech. And we later find out he lost his life through it and his two sons died through it. How many would have died if they'd stayed in Bethlehem? Well, three out of four of them died by going to Moab. But the writer of the Hebrews warns us about going back uh, thinking that's an option of going cold in our faith and just going back to where we were before. In Hebrews 10, it says this, and it's worth reading it all. Listen. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. 
Sometimes you were publicly exposed, publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those who were in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he promised. I think that's a powerful, you know, encouragement to us to stay the course. Um, so Elimelech doubtless had these good intentions, um, but I don't think his decision was one based on faith. I'm not too sure that he prayed that much about it. I could be wrong, but just don't get that sense. Uh, you might note, though, 10 years later, whenever Naomi did return with Ruth back to Bethlehem, the people there were in the middle of plenty. You ask yourself, well, if Elimelech had just stayed the course, stayed in the land that was promised to his people, how would it have worked out for them? Well, anyway, you think of the children of Israel. Keith Green sang a song, So You Want to Go Back to Egypt. The children of Israel pined for the vegetables and the, the fresh food of Egypt, forgetting all about the fact they were slaves and were beaten to a pulp. You know, Lot's wife looked back and that didn't work out so good either. And Jesus said this in Luke chapter 9. He, Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And Paul talked about this pressing forward in the Christian faith. He talked about in Philippians chapter 3 about I press forward to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Remember that? I press forward. I remember uh, one year, a lot of years ago, Alan and Drew and Craig and I were walking from, we decided to walk from Port Rush home and um, not all in one go. <laughs> but one night we, we stayed at Carrick Reed. We camped on the field above Carrick Reed Rope Bridge. <clears throat> and the next day was about a 26 mile hike. It was quite far with heavy packs. And as we're going through a very long and monotonous pine forest, up in the Antrim Plateau, the rain was on, it was cold, we were getting wetter, but could we find anywhere to camp? You know the story, John? <laughs> um, sadly, it's tragically familiar, but anyway. And uh, of course, we realized we just had to get down off the heights, and uh, we ended up at a wee place called Aura Bridge, but um, I knew it was quite a bit to go, and we just had to determine ourselves. We said, Look, we're not, we can't camp up here tonight. It's wet, it's cold. There's nowhere to put the tent. It's all rocky. We're in forestry. We just have to press on. And we just determined, the four of us, right, we're miserable, we're wet, cold and tired. Let's just press on. And eventually we find a very nice wee spot. Unfortunately, we left the tent poles back at Carcarade. That's another story. <laughs> but... I'll just say this, in case he's listening, it wasn't me, right? Mm -hmm. But it might have been one of the other three, I'll not mention any names. Anyway, Orpah and Ruth were just finally, I don't want to go on too long, but Orpah and Ruth. Interestingly, did you know, just as a, a small fact, uh, Oprah Winfrey's parents called her Oprah because they, they misread Orpah in the Bible. They wanted to call their daughter after Orpah, and thought it was Oprah, Oprah, but it's Orpah. Um, anyway, so these two girls are both challenged. The daughters-in-law are both challenged, you know, um, about what they're prepared to live and die for. And they both, and it, if you read it, they both cry openly and loudly. They want to go on with their mother-in-law back to Bethlehem. Now for, for Naomi, she's taken that life decision. She's going back. And someone once said, whenever you find you discover you're in the wrong place of God's will. That's the time to turn around and go back to where you were last walking with him. Not so for Ruth. Ruth hadn't to go back. She's doing a whole completely change of lifestyle. She's going to be going forward. And um, But the two of them weep with Naomi. and uh, But Ruth's not for going back. Orpah is keen to go with her mother-in-law, but the depth just isn't quite that deep. And so she's... in. With, she's able to be persuaded to go back to her people and back to their 
alien gods. But Ruth had made a decision and she wasn't going to be moved from it. That's why I read that. I think it's such a beautiful piece of scripture, isn't it? You know, suffer me not to leave. You know, it's just beautiful. Treat, treat me not to leave thee. She had seen something beyond just the temporal. And Ruth, it's really interesting, again, quoting C.S. Lewis, Lewis said, every contact you make with everyone you meet will help or hinder them on their journey to heaven. And although Naomi was bitter, she had made a choice now that she's going back. Maybe in her heart she realized that she should never have left Bethlehem. I think probably that's right. And she's now going back. But there's something that Ruth, not just that she loved her mother-in-law, but there was something about Naomi's life that affected Ruth. And again, Lewis said just shortly after that, he said, don't shine so that others can see you. Shine that so that through you, others can see him. There's a lovely chorus we'll sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow because I've decided to follow Jesus. And I just think, we'll just finish with this because it won't be too long. But there's a beautiful end of this chapter. We didn't read the whole chapter. Maybe just read the last couple of verses. So they go back. Ruth goes back with Naomi. She turns up at the village and the people are amazed. Verse 19, So the two women went on till they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, which means bitter. Because the Lord has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? And, but then this last verse. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. It's such a... It's like, a wee, it's like a window opening and fresh air coming. There's such hope in that, I think. They're coming back just as the barley harvest has begun. It's come back into this blessing. And I just think it's, it's a thrilling beginning to the rest of the book. And it bodes of such a future hope. You know, if we were just reading this for the first time, we don't know yet what's going to happen. Are they going to find anywhere to live? How are they going to live? How are they going to feed themselves? What about the land they left behind? What, a, what about uh, Ruth? She's lost her husband. You know, and, but of course, we know the story and we know that it opens up in this tremendous hope. There's that lovely hymn chorus. goes like this. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. And I think faith would add a new line. The faith, perhaps, that Ruth had, as with faith she took a journey that she didn't know. Ruth was going back, or Naomi was going back on a journey she knew, but Ruth was going on one, an act of faith. Hope adds a new line to that hymn I just quoted, and it will surprise you what the Lord will do. Let's just pray. Father, I just thank you for your word that it speaks to us. And Lord, it challenges all of our hearts, just where we are, and to take steps of faith and trust. And even though, Lord, times are difficult, Lord, still to hold fast to your promises, because, Lord, you do not lie or change. You are not a man that you should lie. Lord, you are truth itself, an embodied truth, and your promises are yes and amen. And, oh, Lord, for us, sometimes we feel as if time's going on and we're not seeing the answers to prayers. Yet, Father, you're never a second too late in the right time for the right answer. And so, Lord, as we come together here in the hall and folks at home, we pray for us as we pray, Lord, and bring before you our, our entreaties and our supplications and our requests. Father, we pray you'd move our hearts and help us to encourage one another to stay the course and where we've gone wrong to turn around and come back. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.